All right, again, reading from the San Jose Mercury for Tuesday, November 3rd, 1987. Uh, the headline of this particular article, Defense Post Would Cap Carlucci's Career. Dateline, Washington, an AP Wire story. Frank Carlucci, who began his government career as a foreign service officer, has played key roles in four administrations. The fifth national security advisor in the Reagan administration, Carlucci took over as the Iran-Contra affair began to unfold, and Rear Admiral John Poindexter resigned from the post under fire. If he succeeds Caspar W. Weinberger as Secretary of Defense as expected, Carlucci will have the most visible position of his career in public service which was interrupted from 1983 to 1986 by a stint in private business. And, of course, Frank Carlucci's private business was some rather e uh, interesting dealings with uh, one of America's best-known commercial names, among other things. Well, Sears, of course. Yes. Sears was, uh, after, it wasn't Sears World Trade Center, but uh, one, one of the members of one of the elements of the Sears operation, I'm not sure which, just offhand. Now, again, the uh, Frank Carlucci now, of course, is uh, succeeding Cap Weinberger, has succeeded Cap Weinberger as Secretary of Defense. Now, of course, he is no longer heading the National Security Council. That job is being headed up by Lieutenant General Colin L. Powell. We'll take a look at his connections to the Iran-Contra team here in just a second. Reading now from the San Francisco Examiner of Monday, November 16th of 1987. This is a story by Neil Rowland of the UPI. It's headline, GOP swipe at Iran-Contra figures, and down in a, sub, uh, a subdivision of this article, headline, Powell's role, we find the following. Again, this from the San Francisco Examiner of November 16th of 1987. Army Lieutenant General Colin L. Powell, the National Security Advisor designate, was involved in the secret sales of arms to Iran, but congressional investigators decided to have him testify privately rather than in public, the Washington Post reported Monday. Citing Iran-Contra committee sources it did not identify, the newspaper said Powell, then military assistant to Defense Secretary Caspar Weinberger, had acted as a coordinator for the Pentagon in the November 1985 shipment of Hawk anti-aircraft missiles to Iran, passed information several times to principal participants, and acted as a contact point for the White House. A White House spokesman, Bob Hall, said Sunday night that he had no comment on the report. The paper said that in his private testimony before the congressional committees, Powell had failed to recall key details of his involvement. That apparently has not blocked his appointment, however. And again, uh, we see the same people who apparently pull these things off being in charge with apparently investigating them. That's right. Another interesting sidelight of Frank Carlucci's tenure uh, as National Security Council, uh, na as head of the National Security Council, uh, ra rather as NSA advisor, which is a cabinet-level position again, um, was uh, talked about in an article from the Houston Post of December 24, 1986. This article was provided to us by May Russell. The article is headlined, New Staff Selections, and it comes from the column of Evans and Novak. Dateline, Washington. The glimmer of the first silver lining in the cloud darkening President Reagan's presidency is discernible in the new staff at the NSC, the original source of his troubles, where an unexpectedly rich transfusion of blood is raising hopes for preserving Reaganite national security policies. The new staff selections by incoming national security advisor have uh, in, excuse me, the new staff selections by incoming national security advisor Frank Carlucci have stunned the bureaucracy. Nobody expected him to hire Jose S. Sorzano, a Gene Kirkpatrick protege, and the CIA's Fritz W. Ermarth, E-R-M-A-R-T-H, privately described by William Casey as, quote, the strongest Soviet specialist in town, unquote. On top of that, hardline arms control specialist Fritz Kramer unexpectedly is being retained. That foretells career civil servant Carlucci's intention to halt policy power filtering from the Reagan White House to the State Department, as Secretary of State George Shultz has planned since the Iran arms scandal began in early November. It guarantees tough down-the-line competition with Shultz, not obeisance from a disgraced NSC staff as feared by conservatives. Skipping down, by the way, in case you couldn't tell, the Evans and Novak column, especially Robert Novak's contributions, tend to be extremely conservative themselves. Reshaping the entire NSC staff in the middle of an administration has never been tried before, particularly one that is now on its record fifth national security advisor. Carlucci's original plan was to fire all staffers with at least four years in the Reagan White House. He quickly gave that up because it would have sacrificed some high talent, including strategic arms specialist Kramer. 
Well, uh, again, the idea of anybody in the Reagan White House being called a strategic arms specialist, um, uh, or how did they phrase it earlier, um, arms control specialist, um, is rather a joke. But Fritz Kramer is a man whose name is, uh, is much more interesting than merely his position as a supposed uh, arms control specialist. Uh, we've talked about Fritz Kramer a lot on the show. He's sort of the, uh, the, the focal point of an ongoing uh, mystery that Mae Brussel has talked about all, quite a bit. Now, <clears throat> the Fritz Kramer talked about there, and by the way, the, in a later article, the uh, later disclaimer, Evans and Novak claimed that they meant Sven Kramer, not Fritz Kramer. Sven Kramer is Fritz Kramer's son. The interesting thing is, the thing is that uh, Fritz Kramer was the former head of the plans office for the United States Army for many years, I believe 49 through 70. At any rate, uh, one of the significant things about uh, the, retain the retention of Fritz slash Sven Kramer, whichever one it really is, and again, uh, the Sven Kramer is Fritz's son, is that uh, Fritz Kramer, one of his protégés, was Henry Kissinger. We're not going to go into it uh, in terms of the documentation at this point, but in 1975, in an article by Nick Timish in the Washington Post called The Iron Mentor, Fritz Kramer is described as uh, the person who, in many ways, counseled Henry Kissinger and got him into his present situation. Fritz Kramer served with Henry Kissinger in the 970th Counterintelligence Corps. That was a, an army unit at the end of World War II, uh, one of whose main functions was the recruiting of SS and Gestapo veterans to serve as U.S. intelligence people after the war. That was one of Kissinger's specialties. And uh, it's significant here that, uh, for our purposes, that, that Henry Kissinger's name, uh, Fritz Kramer's name, rather, should crop up in connection with uh, the retention of Sven slash Fritz in light of the, the many Kissinger connections to the Iran-Contra scandal that we went into primarily in RFA number 31. Recall that Task Force 157 that Ed Wilson and many of the other members of the secret team worked for headed up, according to Penny Lernoux, by Henry Kissinger. Recall also that, according to some columns by Jack Anderson, it was combined Henry Kissinger and David Rockefeller pressure that caused the hostages, to, or caused the Shah to be admitted to Iran, to the United States in the first place, which resulted in the taking of the hostages, even though the State Department and CIA had warned them not to do that. And we speculated against the background of the destable, against that again, as destabilization of the Carter regime, for the uh, Carter administration for removing certain members of the secret team from power. Beyond that, we took a look at the fact that Robert uh, McFarlane, one of the key players in this whole scenario, also a Kissinger protege. This is interesting, bearing in mind the law firm of Paul, Weiss, Rifkind, Wharton, and Garrison. It's interesting to note uh, what law firm was representing Henry Kissinger in the, right about the time the Iran-Contra scandal broke. Again, from the San Jose Mercury News of Sunday, November 2nd of 1986, this is a story entitled, Penthouse Looking at Another Suit. It says, Henry the K is in the news again, and this time he's fighting mad. Kissinger is promising to go to court to prevent an interview with him from appearing in the December penthouse. Simon Rifkind, attorney for Kissinger, said he will file legal papers Monday seeking an order stopping publication and distribution of the magazine. Publisher Bob Guccione's reaction to this is classic Guccione. Quote, what can you expect from a man who believes Vietnam was a moral war? Unquote. He added that a prior restraint on the press is unconstitutional. So again, uh, it's, it's worth uh, speculating on about the uh, Kramer retention by Frank Carlucci. Uh, he was being retained in the, the, the National Security Council that Carlucci was supposedly going to clean up. And again, <clears throat> the, the Rifkin law firm drew up the incorporation papers for TCI. That is the von Bolschwang Electronics Company, which through international imaging systems intersects with Stanford Technology, Again, we went into that at considerable length in Radio Free America number 30 for people who would like to review that connection. But the Rivkin Law Firm, in addition to the Lyman connection, significant because of its connections to TCI. Now, one of the uh, the first response on the behalf on behalf of the authorities uh, to this uh, dreadful problem of the Iran Contra scandal beginning to break was the appointment by Ronald Reagan of the Tower Commission. And uh, we're going to read a little bit about the makeup of the Tower Commission uh, from the New York Times of Thursday, November 27th of 1986. The headline, The President's Panel, and it talks about the three members as follows. Edmund S. Muskie was Democratic Senator from Maine from 1959 to 1980 when he resigned to become Secretary of State, 72 years old, replaced Cyrus R. Vance, who resigned over the failed effort to rescue American hostages in Iran, spent his nine months as Secretary of State helping try to negotiate release of the hostages. 
uh, was chairman of the Senate Budget Committee in 1974-80, graduate of Cornell Law School, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, a Democratic Party candidate for vice president in 68, an unsuccessful run for the presidency in 72. For our purposes, most importantly, his replacement of Cyrus Vance, and we'll go back to that. Brent Scowcroft, vice chairman of Kissinger Associates, a consulting concern headed by former Secretary of State Henry A. Kissinger. 61 years old, spent 25 years in the Air Force, left with the rank of Lieutenant General, graduated from West Point, received Master's and Ph. degrees from Columbia, was National Security Advisor in 75 to 77 under President Ford, and was Deputy National Security Advisor in 73-75 under Mr. Kissinger in the Nixon administration. And it goes on to mention some of his other involvements with the War College and uh, Chairman of the Presidential Commission on Strategic Forces, etc., etc., John Tower, uh, of course, a Republican senator from Texas for 24 years, up until 1985, was chairman of Armed Services Committee and a strong supporter of President Reagan's military buildup, was until earlier this year the United States negotiator on long-range missiles at nuclear arms talks in Geneva. A um, couple of other significant things about John Tower. We should mention John Tower, of course, just happened to be in the car when John F. Kennedy, um, excuse me, was not in the car, but he was... Um, John Connolly, of course, was in the car. Uh, John Tower was the person to whom Lee Harvey Oswald wrote requesting permission to get back into the United States. Thank you. I was blanking out. Yes, exactly. John Tower was, uh, it was received communication from Lee Harvey Oswald, and when Lee Harvey Oswald had uh, emigrated or uh, deserted or fled or whatever to the Soviet Union and then wanted to come back, again, mentioning the fact that uh, Lee Harvey Oswald's return to the United States was a very easy one for a man who was supposed to have run off with all of the uh, special information about the top-secret U-2 program. Um, okay, so some, some of the people on the President's panel... Uh, again, Ed Muskie replaced Cy Vance, who resigned over the attempt, the failed attempt to rescue American hostages in Iran. Of course, that was the failed Desert One mission. We've talked in the past, uh, during the same series, about the fact that, among other things, there were several members of the secret team involved in the Desert One mission, including Oliver North himself. Um, also interesting because, of course, as we mentioned even earlier in this broadcast, that there are now strong implications that, in fact, that the uh, last year of the Carter administration was basically a year-long attempt to finally destabilize the government, uh, performed by the Reagan campaign staff with the help of certain moles, uh, turncoats, or whatever you want to call them, within the presidential administration of Jimmy Carter, um, and uh, that the manipulation of the hostage crisis uh, led, in fact, to the beginning of the arms shipments to uh, Iran. So, again, uh, Ed Muskie's replacement of Cyrus Vance is at least curious in this light. Uh, Ed Muskie was also uh, reportedly the recipient of one of Richard Nixon's uh, uh, dirty tricksters, most profound dirty tricks, uh, the slipping of a, uh, a, a quasi-psychotic drug into, his, uh, into something of his uh, during his presidential campaign in 1972. This is a rumor has never been proved, but there has been, been a lot of talk about it. Brent Scowcroft, of course, we talked about uh, Kissinger's connections to this case through Task Force 157, through the law firm of uh, Paul Weiss, Rifkin, etc., etc., um, through things of that nature. And, of course, Scowcroft is basically Henry Kissinger's man, and has been. He works very closely with Kissinger, and, all, and has for many, many years. And last but not least, John Tower, who, as we mentioned, had uh, some interesting connections to the Kennedy assassination, and has some other interesting connections, for our purposes, as we'll talk about in a bit, with a rather interesting and shadowy figure of the international world of uh, arms smuggling and gun running and arms trading, which we shall talk about anon, but it's particularly interesting for our purposes because, of course, this is the whole operation that the Iran-Contra thing feeds off of is the international world of gu the gun trade. A little, more in trade. Yeah, a little more information about the makeup of the Tower Commission. Research credit on this article also goes to Mae Russell. This is from In These Times, specifically In These Times issue of June 24th of 1987. Before you start, let me just mention broadcasting from Foothill College this is KFJC, Los Altos Hills. All righty, again, uh, this is from In These Times, issue of June 24th of 1987. This is an article headline, Did Reagan Steal the 1980 Election? It's co-authored by Barbara Honiger, who you heard referred to in an earlier article and whose work we used in the past, and Jim Norikas, N-A-U-R-E-C-K-A-S. The section of the article we're going to read here concerns the makeup of the Tower Commission. 
Tower, the commission's head, was McFarlane's boss at the time of his October 1980 meeting with the Iranian, as well as Reagan's campaign chief in Texas. McFarlane also worked for Brent Scowcroft, another member of the commission, when Scowcroft was President Ford's national security advisor. The board's token Democrat was Muskie, Carter's Secretary of State, who, according to Allen, passed vital information about the hostage, hostage negotiations to a journalist friendly to the Reagan camp. So again, Tower connected to McFarlane, Tab McFarlane also connected to Brent Scowcroft, both uh, McFarlane and Brent Scowcroft connected to Kissinger. Recall that Brent Scowcroft is vice chairman of Kissinger Associates, the powerful Kissinger law firm. And again, the board's token Democrat, Muskie, who uh, was alleged, uh, accorded by Richard Allen, to have passed vital information about the hostage negotiations to the Reagan camp. It should also be noted that uh, Ed, Ed Muskie as well is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. It is, is so described in another article as a member of the, um, of the Council on Foreign Relations. That, of course, is heavily influenced by Rockefeller money. So, again, with the implications of the Rockefeller camp, including Henry Kissinger in the destabilization of the Carter administration, it's interesting to see so many of these people connected up with uh, each other and with the alleged investigation. Indeed. And... Uh we're going to talk a little bit more about some of these folks, specifically John Tower, but some of the others, too. Uh, I'm going to read from an article published in the San Jose Mercury News, Thursday, November 27th of 1986. The headline, Tower has ties to NSC figures. McFarlane and new acting chief were once his aides, is the subhead, and this is an Los Angeles Times story. John Tower, picked by President Reagan to head an inquiry into National Security St Council staff operations, has close ties to the staff's new acting chief, Alton G. Keel, Jr., as well as a recent predecessor, Robert C. Bud McFarlane, who faces intense scrutiny for his role in the secret arms deal with Iran. Both McFarlane and Keel served as top aides to Tower when the Texas Republican was the ranking minority member on the Senate Armed Services Committee. In fact, Keel keeps in his office a photograph of him and Tower together. Such personal ties led some on Capitol Hill to question Wednesday whether Tower would be able to remain objective in the inquiry. Another former Tower aide, Ronald F. Lehman, was director of the National Security Council's Arms Control Office until last May when he succeeded Tower as U.S. negotiator at the Soviet arms control negotiations in Geneva. Skipping down, and here is the reference Dave cited a moment ago, uh, Edwin Muskie, age 72, a senior partner in a law firm specializing in international law, is chairman of the Center for National Policy, a democratic think tank, and is active in the Council on Foreign Relations. So again, just confirming those particular ties, Towers ties to the National Security uh, Agency, of course, very strong. Ed Muskie's ties to the Council on Foreign Relations, again, a Rockefeller-backed product. We mentioned earlier, among other things, uh, David Rockefeller's involvement with Henry Kissinger in assuring that the Shah would come to the United States, despite the fact that everybody knew and talked about that his... Uh, his uh, safe haven in the United States would probably lead to uh, serious rioting and the taking of hostages, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, another interesting connection between people in, uh, implicated in one aspect or another of the Iran-Contra scandal and the Tower Commission was brought to light, among other places, in, an in a magazine called, or a publication called The City Paper. Our understanding from a listener is that this is a free newspaper, sort of like the San Jose Metro, which is distributed in the Washington, D.C. area. This is from the City Paper of November 13th of 1987, an article by one of our old standby researchers, one of the top researchers in this field, this being Jonathan Marshall. It's headlined, Dark Quadrant, subheaded, Plotting Ollie North's Seamy Underworld of Drugs, Guns, and Terrorism. And in, uh, uh, we're going to talk here about the connection of Manzer el Kassar, Merex, uh, Gerhard Mertens, and others. We went into this in considerable length in RFA number 32, talking about a shipment of arms from... Uh, Abu Nidal and Abu Abbas associate Manzer el Kassar, Marshall writes as follows. When al Kassar's final load came to Wilmington aboard the Iceland saga, the Pentagon didn't haul the full shipment off to its warehouses. According to the Los Angeles Times of March 31st and May 9th, Michael Wines and May William Rempel, much of the ammunition was transferred to Merex Corporation in Savannah, Georgia. Merex of Savannah is a mysterious, almost invisible firm. A spokesperson for the Federal Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms says no de arms dealer of that name is registered in Georgia. Several other companies named several other companies named Merex exist elsewhere in the U.S. and abroad, but no one is inclined to talk. 
A Pakistani named Arif Durrani, D-U-R-R-A-N-I, operated Amerix Incorporated out of Newbury Park, California, until he was arrested and convicted this year of conspiring to ship Hawk missile parts to Iran in the summer of 1986. Durrani claimed to have arranged the deal on behalf of North and Secord, but a Connecticut jury didn't believe him. There is a Marex Corporation in Alexandria, Virginia, licensed by the federal government as a firearms dealer. Contacted by telephone, its employees claim no knowledge of the shipment and are reluctant to discuss anything having to do with arms. The Marex, known to every international arms dealer, is the West German firm Marex AG, founded by Gerhard Mertens, who served as a paratroop major in World War II under the daring SS commando leader Otto Scorzani. After the war, Scorzani escaped from a prisoner of war camp and made his way to Spain, where he oversaw the formation of such SS mutual aid networks as Odessa and Daishpina. In the early 50s, Scorzani and Mertens turned up as advisors to the Egyptian military. Both entered the international arms business. Scorzani is an agent for Krupp, Mertens as the German representative for the famous expatriate armed, a uh, famous American, for the famous expatriate American dealer Sam Cummings. Let me reread that last sentence. Both entered the international arms business. Scorzani is an agent for Krupp. Mertens is the German representative for the famous expatriate American dealer Sam Cummings, as we looked at. Sam Cummings, of course, or as we will be looking at very shortly, Sam Cummings is the brother-in-law of Senator John Tower, the head of the Tower Commission. It should be noted that uh, last account, uh, Gerhard Mertens and Sam Cummings were on poor terms. It should be noted, though, that uh, Sam Cummings mentioned that he was not involved in the Iran-Contra effort himself, so it may be that others uh, who were rivals of Sam Cummings got the contract, but that they were still able to utilize some of the same connections in effecting those contracts. Continuing, in 1963, with Scorzani's help, Mertens founded Merex. Fronting for German intelligence, it made undercover sales of surplus weapons to a wide variety of clients that Bond could not sell arms to directly, including several Arab states. Mertens also sold surplus West German jet fighters to Iran, Venezuela, and Pakistan. In 1966, Mertens set up an American branch in suburban Washington, which was authorized by the State Department munitions office as late as 1975 to sell, quote, ordnance and law enforcement equipment and materials, unquote. The Nazi war criminal Klaus Barbie represented Marex in Latin America. He and a partner arranged deals with the governments of Bolivia, Chile, Paraguay, and Peru. They also handled Marex business with Scorzani, who made a fortune selling arms to the Middle East from his base in Spain. When West German intelligence shifted brokers in the late 60s, Marex went into decline. The business was further damaged when the German government prosecuted Mertens unsuccessfully for tax evasion in the mid-1970s. Nonetheless, Mertens still gets around. In the late 70s, the Italian press reported that Marek's guns were turning up in the hands of notorious neo-fascist terrorists in Europe. And in early 1985, a prominent Mexican newspaper columnist accused Mertens of dealing arms illegally in Mexico. Mertens was expelled from the country two months before the columnist was killed. Mexico's attorney general stated last May that he now entertains the hypothesis, unquote, that Mertens could have, have had something to do with the murder. The mysterious Marex branch that received the wandering load of arms shared an address with Combat Military Ordnance Limited. According to Newsday and the Los Angeles Times, the owner of Combat Military Ordnance, James Atwood, was the real recipient of the ammunition diverted from this shipment. As a prominent international weapons dealer, manufacturer of replica Nazi daggers, and self-proclaimed owner of, quote, probably the largest collection in existence, unquote, of German knives and swords, it's not too much to assume that Atwood had friendly ties to the German Marex. A former, fed, a former federal agent who knows Atwood says his German wife comes from, quote, a wealthy arms family may be related to the Crips, unquote. We mentioned the, the probable Mertens-Atwood connection here because James Atwood himself intersects not only with Frank Triple, a member of the Triple Wilson team, of course, but also with the company, quote, unquote, the Arms for Drug Smuggling Ring, which uh, has was basically connected up with a number of aspects of the case. We're going to come to that later. But again, Gerhard Mertens is the key person here. All right, and we're going to read as follows. Um, I'm going to read a little bit here from Deadly Business, a book written by Patrick Brogan and Albert Zarka. Deadly Business is subheadlined or subtitled Sam Cummings' Inner Arms and the Arms Trade. The article is copyright 1983, published by W.W. W. Norton and Company of New York. And again, Sam Cummings, uh, the, the leader of Inner Arms, and uh, as we mentioned before, uh, uh, extremely uh, important arms dealer worldwide. 
Reading from Deadly Business, the local newspapers were intrigued and pushed their inquiries into the provenance of this huge quantity of Soviet munitions. Senator John Tower, who had just been elected to Lyndon Johnson's seat, this is in, uh, by the way, in 1962, uh, Senator John Tower, who had just been elected to Lyndon Johnson's seat, consulted the State Department and issued a statement to the effect that the ammunition was a speculation of inter-arms, quote, which found out that the bullets could not be sold to U.S. customers, unquote. As Thayer dryly observes, Cummings would have known that before he imported the material. Much later, Tower, and again, that's Senator John Tower, Tower married Cummings' sister. So, as Dave mentioned a moment ago, confirmed in the book Deadly Business, uh, John Tower is, in fact, related by marriage to Sam Cummings, the head of Inner Arms and the world's leading private arms dealer. Okay, so that, uh, again, bear in mind the cummings Gerhard mertens link and the Cummings-Tower link. Again, last we heard Mertens and uh, Sam Cummings weren't on very good terms. Perhaps that's why Sam Cummings was cut out of the Iran-Contra situation. But again, bearing in mind the Merrick's connections to BND, to uh, Stefano Della Chiai, to uh, Guido Giannatini, and to a lot of other things, Klaus Barbie and some of the others, uh, it, it, it's interesting that we see the Merex name cropping up here. We're going to come back to the company, too, after a break. Indeed, and uh, we are going to be gone for a few minutes, and we're going to play a little music and give you a chance to stretch. Finished uh, talking a bit about the makeup of the Tower Commission, the uh, rather uh, doubtful antecedents of the Tower Commission's uh, personnel or commissionaires. Uh, John Tower, of course, his vast and uh, and long-enduring involvement with the uh, uh, the right wing of American politics, his involvement with the Armed Services Committee, his affiliation with uh, through marriage with Sam Cummings of Inner Arms, uh, come his own uh, involvement with a variety of uh, uh, things uh, not likely to lead to a uh, a very uh, jaundiced view of the doings of the Reagan administration. We talked about Brent Scowcroft and his collect connections to Henry Kissinger, which are vast and overarching, and uh, Henry Kissinger, of course, plays a rather interesting, although at this point somewhat arcane, uh, position in the uh, in the whole Iran-Contra affair uh, from his connections back to Task Force 157, home of Ed Wilson et al., uh, a charter member of the secret team, and other things. And, uh, of course, Ed Muskie, whose rather strange tenure in the State Department as Secretary of State took place um, under the shadow of the collapse of the attempt to rescue the hostages from Iran in 1980, again, a, a uh, collapse that might be linked to the number of secret team members involved in the operation itself, and then also running parallel to the Reagan campaign's attempt to subvert democracy by m cutting deals with the Ayatollah as far as holding the hostages until the Reagans were safely in office. So now we're going to go on from there, and we're going to talk a little bit more about some other interesting folk. Now, we left off the discussion last time with our discussion of the intersection between Samuel Cummings, the brother-in-law of John Tower, Senator John Tower, and a fellow named Gerhard Mertens, the founder of Merex Corporation, and also for a while the German representative of Cummings' firm. Among the apparent intersections of uh, Mr. Mertens was a fellow named James Atwood, who whether or not he actually intersected with Mertens, as Marshall speculated about in that article, certainly has intersected with, among others, Frank Turple, and with the company, quote-unquote. Now, in Radio Free America number 26, and also to a lesser extent in number 32, we talked about the company, quote-unquote, and uh, that is an arms for drug smuggling ring, which uh, appears to have connections to U.S. intelligence, if not, in fact, being an extension of U.S. intelligence. Now, one of the main aspects of the company, quote-unquote, situation that we looked at in RFA number 26 was the assassination of elements of the the assassination of Judge John Wood of Texas by elements of the company, quote unquote. Now in that killing the main points are that the convicted assassin Charles Harrelson claimed that the DEA was attempt actually was behind the killing because uh, Judge Wood was going to expose the involvement of elements of the DEA in drug trafficking. This should be borne in mind because we're going to come back to the DEA later in the program. Also, Charles Harrelson claimed to have been one of the assassins for the assassination of John Kennedy. It's also worth noting that uh, Charles Harrelson was an organized crime associate of a well, he was an associate of a lot of organized crime figures who intersect with, among others, Santos Traficante of the Shooters Team, also an, a, uh, an intimate of Robert Vesco. Again, we looked at this in RFA number 26, also in RFA number 32. Now, if, well, we should say when... Uh, possible criminal charges are to be filed in connection with the Iran-Contra scandal, certainly the FBI will be involved. 
And it's worth noting that the new person who was going to be heading the FBI was the person, the judge, William Sessions, who presided over the Judge Wood case. Again, bearing in mind the intersections of James Atwood and Frank Turple with the company, quote-unquote, the intersection of Charles Harrelson and people of the company with the organized crime milieu of Santos Traficante and their involvement with the Contra supply effort. Bear all of those in mind as you hear the following article. This story comes from the San Francisco Chronicle of Saturday, September 26th of 1987. An AP story dateline Washington. It's headline, Senate Approves New FBI Director. The Senate overwhelmingly approved the nomination of Judge William Sessions yesterday to a statutory 10-year term as director of the FBI. The Senate voted 90 to nothing to approve President Reagan's nomination with both Democrats and Republicans praising the credentials of Sessions, who replaces William Webster, now head of the Central Intelligence Agency. A self-avowed West Texas, t- skipping down on the article, a self-avowed West Texas tough guy known for his handling of drug and immigration cases, Sessions, a former prosecutor and Justice Department official, is perhaps best known for presiding over the trials and sentencing of the killer and conspirators in the assassination of U.S. District Judge John H. Wood in 1979. Wood was the first federal judge to be murdered in more than a century. Sessions imposed two life terms on the convicted killer and sentences of five to thirty years for the three other defendants. Skipping down still further, he was named U.S. Attorney for the Western District of Texas in 1971 by President Richard Nixon. On December 24, 1974, President Gerald Ford appointed him to a district judge. He served in El Paso before his appointment in San Antonio. Well, we would point out that none of the allegations concerning the company came out in the trial of Judge John Wood. Uh, Harrelson eventually took the fall. None of Harrelson's charges were investigated. And in light of the, fact, the connections of the company, quote-unquote, to people involved in the Iran-Contra scandal, again, we have to ask the question whether William Sessions is really the best uh, choice as head of the FBI here in light of the fact that he doesn't appear to have pursued all of the aspects of the Judge Wood investigation with all due vigor. Now, of course, he, William Sessions is now the new head of the FBI because the old head of the FBI, William Webster, is now the new head of the CIA. And there are questions about William Webster's uh, functioning vis-a-vis the Iran-Contra scandal as well. Uh, before I start that, I just and I may have missed you saying this, Dave, so correct me if I did. Um, I, I wanted to point out that one of the key parts of... Uh, of Harrelson's uh, as- assertions was that John Wood had in fact been been uh, killed uh, specifically on the, at the behest of the DEA, and that uh, that it was because of uh, Wood's investigation uh, into certain uh, drug smuggling matters in which the DEA had knowing complicity that Wood was in fact killed. This is particularly significant because of a lot of the stuff we've been talking about, including Frank, Frank Turple's assertions that George Bush's uh, drug task force in Florida was merely an attempt to get the DEA and use it as a hypodermic to uh, inject CIA men into various Central American um, political situations and things of that nature, and the fact that the DEA has cropped up in several uh, circumstances uh, regarding the, the contra drug uh, money and things of that nature. Anyway, going to read a little bit more. As Dave mentioned, though, the, the other connection is the fact that uh, while Sessions, who presided over the Judge John Wood murder case, has become head of the FBI, William Webster, who was head of the FBI, is now head of the CIA in charge of supposedly uh, uh, making sure that the CIA doesn't do bad things, uh, an idea that uh, we've heard before. Um, the FBI under Webster, however, had some rather interesting involvement with the Iran-Contra case uh, itself, and of course we've been talking in the last few weeks about some of the more recent stories about that. Here's uh, one a little earlier on in the line from the San Jose Mercury News for Friday, May 1st, 1987. The headline, Documents Show FBI Knew of North Dealings in Mid-1985. Now bear in mind, of course, the Iran-Contra case first began to break in about November of 1986, so we're talking about a year and a half gap. The article is by Aaron Epstein of the Mercury News Washington Bureau. It's datelined Washington. The FBI learned in July 1985 that former White House aide Oliver North was, quote, facilitating the channeling of funds, unquote, to the Nicaraguan Contras at a time when Congress barred such official assistance, according to FBI documents made public Thursday by the Senate Intelligence Committee. The information was obtained in an FBI interview of Marine Lieutenant Colonel North on July 18, 1985, 16 months before the Iran-Contra scandal broke, but the investigative agency did nothing about it, the documents showed. 
FBI Director William Webster told the committee Thursday that a memo describing the interview was sent to FBI headquarters but arrived in a, quote, garbled form due to a, quote, technological failure, unquote. In addition, FBI memos disclosed North twice sought to intervene in an FBI criminal investigation in Philadelphia. Skipping down, William Webster testifying at the third and final day of a hearing on his expected confirmation as CIA director vehemently declared that North, quote, had no pipeline into the FBI. Webster said he first learned about the FBI's interview of North less than three weeks ago. Again, if we are to take uh, Judge Webster at his word, um, we have to believe that for some reason this important interview with an important national security officer uh, re came to the FBI headquarters in garbled form due to a technological failure and nobody bothered to find out what the memo would have been about if it hadn't been garbled. Again, these are the kinds of things we're being asked to believe. William Webster, by the way, as we mentioned, was in fact confirmed almost overwhelmingly as head of the CIA. And apparently, as we indicated, as head of the FBI, was not altogether vigorous in his pursuit of some of the violations pursuant to the Contra support effort. Now, obviously, many of the legal uh, implications of the Iran-Contra situation will be handled by the special prosecutor. We've taken a look at special prosecutor Leon Jaworski, affiliated with a CIA domestic funding conduit, also the Warren Commission, and after being Watergate special prosecutor, of course, he went on to become special prosecutor in the Koreagate scandal. Well, there are some questions concerning the special prosecutor in the Iran-Contra scandal as well. Reading from the San Francisco Examiner of Sunday, December 14th for 1986, an Examiner News Services story, Dateline, Washington, headlined, Ex-ABA head may direct Iran probe. Subheaded special prosecutor worked for Nixon and Ike, report says. A panel of federal judges has settled on Lawrence E. Walsh, a former president of the American Bar Association, as independent counsel to conduct a criminal investigation into arms sales to Iran, and transfer of proceeds to the Nicaraguan Contras, according to a report broadcast on National Public Radio Saturday. The NPR report said announcements of Walsh's, and, uh, Walsh's appointment would be delayed until later in the week, pending a review of his legal record to ensure that there would be no conflict of interest. So, they, in, in a scandal involving a conservative Republican administration with strong intersections with the Nixon administration, many people, uh, William Casey, Cap Weinberger, George Shultz among them, served for Richard Nixon. So did Richard Allen. So it's interesting uh, to, that a conservative Republican would be hired to investigate scandals of a Republican administration. Yes, uh, again, uh, the kind of surprise, though, that has become increasingly less surprising as time goes by and as we see it repeated with numbing, and one might even say nauseating frequency. A little more about uh, Lawrence Walsh, uh, who I don't think is mentioned in any of these articles, but I heard the other day his nickname is Darth Vader, which is something interesting to think about. The article that I'm going to read from is a commentary from the op-ed page of the San Jose Mercury News for Friday, January 2nd of 1987, and it's headlined, An Old Boy Prosecutor, and it's written by Alan Dershowitz, who is a, a well-known uh, Harvard uh, University law professor, uh, appears on television a great deal, and uh, frequently does a uh, friend of the court briefs for the ACLU and things like that. As the Iran-Contra independent counsel, Lawrence E. Walsh, gears up for his investigations, many lawyers are quietly raising questions about the way he was chosen and, indeed, the choice itself. Walsh certainly has credentials. His entire adult life looks like an establishment lawyer's dream. Federal judge, U.S. Deputy Attorney General, President of the American Bar Association, senior partner in a prestigious New York law firm, peace negotiator, and member of dozens of commissions. The press duly reported this catalog of credentials, but few pundits paused long enough to ask whether he had succeeded at what he had done. His record in that regard tells a somewhat different story. Walsh's reputation as a judge was mediocre. His work with the American Bar Association was disappointing. His job as a peace negotiator with the North Vietnamese ended in failure. As a Wall Street lawyer, he was known more for his ability to bring business to the firm than for the quality of his legal work. Indeed, in speaking to several lawyers who knew him or who had worked with him, I did not hear anything positive about things he has done, as distinguished from the many things he has been. Walsh is also 75 years old and retired five years ago from his law firm, Davis, Polk & Wardwell. Though he appears vigorous, he is clearly past his prime. Walsh certainly looks like a man of sound judgment, but his track record may belie his appearance. One of his greatest gaffes occurred when he was chairman of the American Bar Association's Standing Committee on the Federal Judiciary. 
his committee approved President Nixon's nomination of G. Harold Carswell to be an Associate Justice of the Supreme Court. Rarely in the course of America's, America's 200-year history has so patently unqualified a judicial nomination been made. Carswell was a racist, a barely literate jurist, and a less than mediocre lawyer. As it turned out, he also had personal problems, which culminated in his arrest in a men's room several years later. Uh, so Lawrence E. Walsh, according to Alan Dershowitz, is a lawyer who at best could be described, again according to Dershowitz, as what you might call an establishment hack or a good old boy. Well, this again is not in, uh, in conflict with what we know of the way these kinds of things have been put together in the past uh, as far as uh, investigating these sources of government corruption and scandal. You bring in the good old boys, the hacks, the people who owe favors, and those who are themselves already hopelessly corrupted by the very people that they are investigating. How corrupted Lawrence Walsh may be remains to be seen, but there are indications that he may be. Again, we're not saying he is, but he may be. Reading from the New York Times of Tuesday, April 28th of 1987, an article by Philip Sheenan, S-H-E-N-O-N, of the New York Times, Dateline, Washington, headlined, Walsh's law firm dealt with Southern Air. The special prosecutor in the Iran-Contra affair, Lawrence E. Walsh, acknowledged today that his Oklahoma City law firm had done work for Southern Air Transport, a Miami-based cargo carrier that has been linked to the case. Mr. Walsh said, however, that the firm's representation of the airline ended within the last two years and that he did not believe there was a conflict of interest. This was not a continuing relationship, and it's a relationship that's over, he said, of the link between the airline and his law firm, Crow and Dunleavy. Mr. Waltz noted that he was not a partner in the firm and did not share in its profits. Southern Air was used to deliver American weapons to Iran and to ferry supplies to the Nicaraguan rebels known as the Contras. In an interview, Mr. Waltz said he learned within the last two days that the firm had done work for Southern Air on two routine cases involving aircraft registration. The Federal Aviation Administration has an aircraft registration center in Oklahoma City. The firm has a specialty, he said. It is expert in the registration of aircraft for sale when people borrow on them as security, he said. The firm does about 1,500 of them a year. We did two for Southern Air. Again, this may be a perfectly innocent connection. Uh, it does appear the law firm dealt with a lot of other airlines in a similar capacity. However, one would think that there would be somewhere a, a prominent legal official with no connections to any of these elements, and that uh, it seems to me that with the tremendous resources at the disposal of those who were selecting the investigators, they might have found someone with no conflict of interest. Again, perhaps this is just a trivial connection, but maybe it isn't. Food for thought, grounds for further research. Uh, it also should be mentioned that when you talk about CIA, uh, CIA air proprietaries and uh, CIA air transport companies like Southern Air, um, one of the things that is known about the way these place, these types of CIA operations, and not just the airline uh, type operations, but other CIA front businesses, that when they do have legal problems, when they do have uh, uh, various other sorts of problems that have to be handled by technological experts, just as when CIA people themselves have medical problems, that they go to CIA doctors, CIA lawyers, and things of that nature. That's an established part of the intelligence field. You don't send your operatives off to deal with laymen. You send them off to people who know how to keep their mouth shut and who presumably already have uh, you know, some intro into the company, uh, capital C, itself. Um, in which case, this does not prove necessarily that Walsh himself is a CIA lawyer, but it certainly suggests that Southern Air, if Southern Air goes to this law firm, that this law firm perhaps has been vetted by the CIA and found to be um, a, a safe law firm to use going to read a little bit more about some of the early progress of Judge Walsh's case, and we're going to hear also a, a name that's going to be rather interesting to those of our One Step Beyond listeners who've been following the Supreme Court nomination procedure. The article is from the San Francisco Chronicle for Saturday, November 7th. The article is headlined, Court Deals Blow to Special Prosecutor. It's a Los Angeles Times wire story dateline, Washington. In a setback for the Iran-Contra Special Prosecutor yesterday, a federal appeals court reversed a contempt citation that would have sent Iranian-American financier Albert Hakim to jail for refusing to turn over the records of eight foreign companies that were used to funnel U.S. weapons to Iran. A three-judge panel, including Supreme Court nominee Douglas Ginsburg, 
ruled that independent counsel Lawrence Walsh could obtain the records only if he could show that the district court that issued the contempt citation had jurisdiction over the individual companies or that an order to Hakim would not violate the Iranian-born businessmen's right to avoid self-incrimination. So, again, an early setback for the role of the special prosecutor in terms of getting some of the financial documents necessary to do any kind of, uh, as we researchers always say, following the money to find out what actually happened. It's also interesting to note uh, Douglas Ginsburg's involvement. Douglas Ginsburg, of course, did not wind up being a nominee for the Supreme Court for very long, as you all know. Now, we're going to, uh, yeah, it's interesting that, that he would have been on the Supreme Court. He is not, however... Uh, he has already apparently been able to affect at least some of the decisions vis-a-vis -vis this case.